Okay, so we will now uh, proceed to the fifth plenary talk of the 29th Philippine Biodiversity Symposium. Our plenary talk today aims to answer why language matters in conservation and how it can be a barrier for effective conservation and management. This is especially important or relevant to us as the Philippines is a country of more than 120 languages. Huh? So our speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Tatsuya Amano is an ecologist and conservation biologist. No? He is primarily interested in how we as scientists can make meaningful contributions to halting and reversing the ongoing global biodiversity crisis. He is particularly committed to tackling gaps in our knowledge needed for conservation uh, uh, of biodiversity and in the effective use of scientific information for biodiversity conservation. His research is focused in particular on the following three aspects of information use in conservation science. Identifying gaps in uh, information and the drivers, overcoming information gaps with modeling approaches, and third, bridging the research implementation gap. He received his PhD at the University of Tokyo in 2006 after which he worked for the National Institute for Agro-Environmental Sciences in Japan for five years. In 2011, he joined the University of Cambridge as a postdoctoral research fellow at the Center for the Study of Existential Risk and a visiting fellow of the Conservation Science Group. Uh, Tatsuya is presently an ARC Future Fellow at the University of Queensland. Huh? So let us now uh, welcome our speaker, Dr. Tatsuya Amano. Great, thanks very much. Thanks very much for the kind introduction. Um, can I share my screen? Great, I hope you can see it. Can you see it? Yes. Great, so uh, first of all, thanks so much for the kind introduction. And also, uh, thanks very much for inviting me to this exciting and extremely important symposium in the Philippines. It is my absolute pleasure to be able to present our work today in front of you all. So my name is Tatsuya Amano, currently based at the University of Queensland in Australia. And I'm also the Deputy Director of Research at the Center for Biodiversity and Conservation, Conservation Science there. So this one. So I have been working on a wide range of topics in biodiversity conservation, especially uh, the ecology and conservation of water about species. But recently, I've been focusing uh, quite intensively on understanding the consequences of language barriers in biodiversity conservation. And just two years ago, uh, just before the pandemic, we officially launched this uh, project called the Translate Project. So today I will introduce some of our recent work on language barriers in biodiversity conservation. So first of all, you might wonder why languages? To answer this question, let me first ask you this. How many languages do you think there are in the world? So some people might know the answer, but some others might not know the answer. And the answer is, it's about 7,000. So obviously you, in the Philippines, you have so many languages, but in the world, there are 7,000 languages in total. And as you know, as conservation scientists, we are starting to recognize increasingly that the biodiversity crisis we are facing now is not only about biodiversity. It's about people and biodiversity. Because people threaten biodiversity, people conserve biodiversity, and biodiversity has a lot to offer to people. And these people from around the world use 7,000 languages to communicate. So why would we not take languages into account when studying biodiversity and tackling its conservation? To me, it seems only natural and absolutely necessary to consider how 
having so many languages among us might affect our understanding and conservation of biodiversity. I would say this perspective has largely been overlooked to date, likely because conservation science has largely been driven by English-speaking countries. But of course, we have English, the common language of science. So surely also having so many other languages shouldn't be a problem. But is this true? English is indeed the most spoken language in the world, but still only spoken by 1.3 billion people, including non-native speakers. The remaining 6 billion people speak other languages. Let's also take a look at these two maps. The map on the left, this map, shows the states and territories where English is the first language. The map on the right is the distribution of threatened species. And as you can see, we have two very contrasting maps. The regions where biodiversity is the richest and is threatened the most, and therefore conservation is needed the most, are often regions where English is not widely spoken. Let's also look at a little bit more detail of why language matters in conservation using this example, common pochard. If we look at the geographical distribution of this species, we can see that it's an extremely wide ranging species. It appears almost everywhere on the Eurasian continent and uh, Northern Africa as well. In fact, we can find common pochard in 108 countries, including the Philippines, across uh, which 75 official languages are spoken in total. So this means wintering populations, for example, in the Philippines, are likely to be affected by threats in other countries where English might not often widely be spoken. On the other hand, some knowledge, some scientific knowledge that is useful for its conservation might be available in, say, Japan or Russia or some other European countries. And of course, conservation planning for this species could involve these 108 countries. So in a study nicely led by uh, Pablo Nigret in our project, we looked at the number of official languages spoken within the distribution of each of the 10,000 bird species in the world. Importantly, we found that over 1,500 species, including 43 threatened species, had 10 or even more official languages spoken within their distribution range. And as you can see in this figure, some threatened species shown in red and yellow here actually have 20 or 30 or even 50 official languages spoken within their distribution range. So in order to study and conserve these species, we clearly need to understand the consequences of having so many languages spoken within each species distribution. But now the question is how exactly language might affect conservation. So this diagram tries to summarize the potential pathways through which language can affect biodiversity conservation. Put simply, having different languages among us can create barriers to information access and barriers to communication. Barriers to information access would be inaccessibility to, for example, scientific literature, disseminated information, and policy documents due to the language used. And this affects research practices, policies, and the general public as well. Barriers to communication also have implications at multiple levels. For example, language can pose a barrier to the development of international collaborations. Language can also impede the formation of effective policy agreements among countries. So today I will be focusing on barriers to information access, but please do have a look at this uh, preprint and the paper uh, for more details on other consequences of language barriers in conservation.
So Translate project has been investigating the many consequences of language barriers in ecology and biodiversity conservation. But this includes language barriers to the global synthesis of scientific knowledge, language barriers to the local application of scientific knowledge, and language, bar language barriers to the uh, career development of non-native English speakers. In this book, I will explain each of the three aspects of language barriers in biodiversity conservation. So how do language barriers affect the synthesis and the application of scientific knowledge in conservation? In this paper published in 2016, we showed that up to 36% of scientific documents on biodiversity conservation appeared to be published in languages other than English. But such non-English language scientific knowledge is possibly underused in the global level synthesis of scientific knowledge because it's not readily accessible. So for this type of language barriers, we are testing questions like how non-English science is used in global knowledge synthesis, and what the consequences of ignoring such non-English language science are. And then there's the other type of language barriers where scientific knowledge available only in English is not effectively used in the local application of scientific knowledge, such as local decision-making in countries where English is not widely spoken. So our questions regarding this type of language barriers are, how science available in different languages is being used in local decision-making, and how language barriers might impede the uptake of English language science. So overall, our project aims to understand the consequences of language barriers to the use of scientific knowledge by answering these questions. Yeah, so let's first look at these two questions on how language barriers might affect the global synthesis of scientific knowledge. So how is non-English language science used in global knowledge synthesis? We looked at the proportion of references cited in these eight IPBS assessments by language. Not surprisingly, English language references dominate in most assessments, with on average 96% of the references cited being in English. And this is in stark contrast to the uh, result we saw earlier that 36% of existing conservation literature was written in no English languages. So this indicates that most of the existing no English language literature is not being used in global level knowledge synthesis. So next, what are the consequences of ignoring no English language science? First, by ignoring non-English language science, it could be losing access to a non-negligible amount of scientific knowledge. Again, in this paper, we showed that about one third of scientific documents on conservation is actually written in languages other than English, especially in Spanish, Portuguese, simplified Chinese, and French. But this result was based on very simple keyword searches so we recently conducted a series of more comprehensive searches for knowing English literature on biodiversity conservation. And the way we have tested this is by conducting discipline-wide searches for studies that test the effectiveness of conservation actions. As some of you might know, a conservation evidence project led by Professor William Sutherland at the University of Cambridge in the UK has been identifying scientific studies that test the effectiveness of conservation actions based on a set of, se set of selection criteria. But the focus so far has been only on English language studies. So our project has used the same criteria to identify relevant non-English language studies. As part of this, we aim to compare the information that has been published in different languages, namely study location, study species, and study designs, in order to understand the consequences of ignoring knowing language science. 
And we identified 1,234 non English language studies that provide evidence on the effectiveness of conservation actions compared to 4,412 English language studies already stored at the conservation evidence database. But these numbers are not directly comparable, actually. And there, there are more English language studies that have been identified by conservation evidence projects that have yet to be stored in the database. But we can at least say that by ignoring knowing strong science, we could be losing access to this amount of scientific knowledge. During the searches, we also identified 466 journals in 19 languages, some of which has, have been publishing papers since the 19th century. So this result alone also indicates that the non-negligible amount of scientific knowledge is still being published in knowing English languages too. <clears throat> Many people often assume that such knowing English language studies are diminishing and science is becoming increasingly globalized. But in this study, uh, led by Sean Chaudhry, we showed that the number of publications on biodiversity conservation has actually been increasing in most languages, especially, especially in Spanish, uh, Portuguese, Central Chinese, Russian, and so on. So contrary to a common perception, the importance of knowing language knowledge in conservation is certainly not diminishing. And another problem is that Ignoring knowing strong science can cause severe biases in our understanding of biodiversity and its conservation. There have already been multiple attempts to test such biases, mainly in the research area of healthcare. For example, it has been shown that more statistically significant results are more likely to be published in English. But this issue is known as uh, language bias in evidence synthesis more specifically, language bias in statistical, statistical results, meaning that the nature and direction of a study, study's results can affect what language it is published in. And we actually found language bias in statistics. Stati in this paper, we showed that effects are hugely different between English language studies and Japanese language studies, also all of these all of these studies were used in the same meta-analysis. However, a slightly different type of language bias might also exist, especially in ecology and conservation, which is language bias in study characteristics. For example, studies conducted on the local spaces might be more likely to get published in knowing language journals, as those studies would not be of high interest to international readers. And in our latest work, we showed that language bias in study characteristics does exist, having serious consequences for evidence synthesis. But these blue grid cells show the distribution of English language studies testing the effectiveness of conservation actions stored in the conservation evidence database. We can see that English language study countries such as the UK and the US, and there is a huge gap in the availability of evidence in other parts of the world, including the most biodiverse regions such as Latin America, Africa, and Asia. I also want to stress that this spatial pattern is extremely common in almost any type of information on biodiversity. Now, when we searched knowing language studies, testing the effectiveness of conservation interventions using the same criteria, we found a number of relevant knowing language studies in those regions with little information based on English language studies, such as Latin America, Russia, and East Asia. So this clearly indicates that there is a systematic bias in study locations between English and non-English language studies. 
Quite often, global assessment and studies report severe biases in the availability of scientific knowledge, but it seems that those biases are at least partly due to the exclusion of knowing Islamic studies in the global synthesis of scientific knowledge. And it's not only about locations. Here's a figure that compares the study spaces between English and the non-English language studies. So these blue bars show the, shows the number of English language studies available for each species. Each species. For example, the bad species with the highest number of English language studies here uh, was uh, Skylab, shown here, with 44 English language studies testing conservation actions for this particular species. And what's most important here is those red bars showing the number of no English language studies per species for those species without any English language studies. So these include 217 bird and 64 mammal species, including this endangered Rajasthan fish owls in Japan and endangered Andean mountain cats in northern Patagonia. So this result indicates that, again, there is a clear bias in study spaces between English and non-English language studies. And by ignoring non-English language studies, we could be losing important scientific evidence that, that is useful for the conservation of uh, these species. <clears throat> However, we also found a difference in the quality of scientific evidence provided between English and non-English language studies. Here we compared the study designs that have been adopted. And as you can see, studies in those nine languages uh, surrounded in this uh, red line used less robust study designs, meaning that the quality of scientific evidence could be lower when compared to English language studies. In contrast, Portuguese and Spanish language studies did not show a significant difference. So also, results varied among languages. The quality of knowing strong science does seem to be lower that, than that of English strong science for many languages. So this means that we need to consider the trade-off between evidence quality and availability. As we have just shown, for many species in countries where English is not widely spoken, evidence may be available only in that local language. In which case, using such lower quality evidence might be better than using no scientific evidence at all, but we still don't know which is better. So this is something we still need to investigate further. Okay, so let's move on to other questions of how language barriers might affect the local application of scientific knowledge. First of all, how is science made available? In we have been busy identifying national reports on the state of biodiversity. In countries where English is not surprised that the very high proportion of non-strange references in most reports shown in yellow and orange here in this sphere. Across these 37 countries, 65% of the references cited was, on average, in a non-English language. And as you might remember, this is a stark contrast to the IPBS assessment, where only 3.4% of the references were written in non-English languages. This high proportion of non-English language references in national biodiversity reports is partly due to report authors recognizing the importance of non-English language scientific knowledge. For example, when we surveyed those report authors, 75% of them answered that they cited non-English language papers because they were indeed relevant to their reports. But apparently, it is also because of the English language barriers. A quarter of the report authors answered 
that they struggled with understanding English language literature when writing their reports. So this clearly indicates that language barriers indeed pose a serious barrier to the uptake of scientific knowledge that is available only in English. So what does this mean for conservation? We do you know that there are at least two scientific evidence in makers have 230 reasons for not using evidence in their decisions. And in countries where English is not widely spoken, Providing necessary evidence only in English would just give decision makers yet another excuse to turn away from scientific evidence. As I said earlier, English is not necessarily widely spoken in regions where conservation is needed the most. But today, scientific knowledge on biodiversity is often published and disseminated only in English, even in those regions. And this is obviously not ideal because users of scientific knowledge in these regions, such as professionals, policymakers, and the general public, often prefer knowledge that is available in their first language. In fact, we are starting to see much, much more evidence reporting this type of language barriers in conservation. For example, half the product area directors in Spain recognize language, language as a barrier use of scientific papers in their decisions. 12 percent of decision makers in Switzerland also reported language barriers, and the Indonesian farmers also prefer information being communicated in their local language. So if, if you publish and disseminate your knowledge only in English, it may not get used effectively in countries and regions where English is not widely spoken. Okay, we now know that language barriers can have significant implications in conservation. So next, let's look at how species are associated, associated with different languages. Based on Pablo's work I mentioned earlier, Brad Woodworth developed an interactive map showing where we can find bird species associated with each official language in the world. So let me show you what uh, it looks like. And obviously, I need to reload it. Sorry about that. Okay. So this is an interactive map. And here, uh, let's look at a uh, Filipino. Great. So I hope you can see it. But uh, here we have Filipino. And this map shows the distribution of species associated with Filipino as an official language. And as you can see, up to 200 species, not only in the Philippines, sorry, I just, yeah, around here, not only in the Philippines, but also in Southeast Asia are associated with Filipino, meaning that those species also occur in the Philippines. So this language could be one of the key languages when compiling and disseminating scientific information on the conservation of those species in Southeast Asia as a whole. So uh, this map obviously includes many other official languages around the world. So please visit our project website and uh, play with this uh, uh, interactive tool. Okay, so let's go back to the slide. <clears throat> And this map summarizes the results across languages. Here we found uh, these areas in Central and Western Asia have particularly high numbers of species associated with many official languages. So we could perhaps say that paying attention to language barriers could be particularly important for the conservation of species in those regions. Okay, so lastly, let me also touch on language barriers to the career development of non-native English speakers or people with a less English, prof English proficiency. Here we have two English sentences with exactly the same content, but there is a slight difference in the writing style. 
the sentence on the left is uh, so-called native-like English, and that on the right is non-native-like English. But as you can see, the difference is sort of so, so small, so subtle. Like if it has forecast here versus just forecast. And the problem is that the recent study based on randomized control trials showed that science written in this non-native like way tends to be rated lower, although the content is exactly the same. So it's not hard to imagine how non-native English speakers can face this sort of disadvantage in every single revision of every single paper they write, in every single grant proposal, every single job application, and so on. So the consequences of language bias to the career development of non-native English speakers are actually huge. Then most journals, most scientific journals recommend asking your colleagues to check your English or use a professional editing service. But I'd say asking your colleague is not easy at all, especially if they are not co-authors. For some people, it can be almost impossible to find native English speakers in the first place. Professional editing services are expensive as well, especially for those from the global South countries. But this paper, not ours, nicely showed that the cost of such editing services can calculate to almost a quarter of the average PhD monthly salary in Colombia. So it's not very realistic for those authors to use these services. The quality of English writing is just one type of disadvantages that non-native English speakers face. The same paper also demonstrates that it takes much, much longer for non-native English speakers to write a paper in English than in their first language, in this case, Spanish. So what I've mentioned are just a few examples of language barriers to the career development of non-native English speakers. And our project is now working on quantifying such disadvantages in multiple ways. <coughs> <coughs> Okay, now that we know language barriers can have serious consequences for conservation, the question is how we can solve these problems. <clears throat> I'd say it's not easy at all, and we definitely need a concerted effort at every level, from individuals to institutions and societies. So in this article, uh, this article, we compiled 10 simple tips for overcoming language barriers, uh, so different types of language barriers in science. Here, tips in orange represent how we can overcome language barriers to knowledge synthesis. Blue is for barriers to knowledge application, and green is for barriers to career development. I will not go into the detail of each point, but let me show you a few examples. First, Disseminate research in multiple languages. So some academic journals have recently started recognizing the importance of multi-language dissemination of scientific findings, and now encourage their authors to provide abstracts in knowing languages, and also write a blog post on their papers in other relevant languages. So this is an example in the Journal of Applied Ecology, where the authors provided a blog post in English and the same blog post are translated in uh, Japanese. And this is a recent, another recent example from the project I'm involved in. With this paper, we are really keen to widely disseminate the importance of teaching evidence-based conservation. So we provided abstracts in seven different languages and also published free education materials in multiple languages. And it seems that providing knowing language abstract does help decision makers. In a survey with uh, report authors on national status of biodiversity, almost half of the authors reported that having knowing language titles and abstracts would help them search and understand English language literature. <clears throat> the same approach is applicable to knowledge dissemination to the broader society. 
For example, the Hong Kong Biodoching Society and the World Wide Society of Japan have jointly made this education material on spoon-built sandpipers in five different languages. Similarly, recently published guidelines of uh, shorebird habitat management were released in seven different languages. But this obviously requires much, much more effort than just producing it in English. But here, the motivation was that it's absolutely necessary and essential for the material to be actually used by local educators and decision makers across those countries. <clears throat> Next, make sure to use knowledge sourced from multiple languages. Of course, this depends on the focus of your activities, but if you are working on issues that occur across multiple, multiple countries, never assume that all relevant information is available in English. One simple yet rarely adopted solution is to find collaborators who are native speakers of different languages, just like we did for this study. Today, conservation science is highly globalized, so finding native speakers of, for example, Spanish, Portuguese, French, and Chinese in your discipline is not that difficult. But this also highlights the importance of developing culturally diverse environments in academia. You know, we need a diverse range of people to make the best use of scientific knowledge and other types of knowledge that is available from around the world. You also need to use appropriate literature search systems to find no English language literature. International search systems such as Web, the Web of Science and Scopus index only a few no English language journals and so are not very helpful for this purpose. But even on the Web of Science, you can choose to use language specific database here. Also, these are not selected in the default option and also depend on institutional subscription. We can also use Google Scholar, which covers pretty much any language, and local literature search systems that are specific to each language. We are hoping to publish a list of these in this paper soon. At our Translate project, we have already compiled a list of 466 peer-reviewed knowing language journals in ecology and conservation. Box one of this paper also provides some practical suggestions on how we could make better use of knowing language literature. So please do have a look. But this should be a good starting point for anyone who wants to explore scientific knowledge available in knowing languages. If you are producing scientific knowledge in knowing languages, we can try to increase the visibility of the knowing language knowledge. I often upload preprints and presentations in Japanese on a uh, fig share here. OSF also uh, stores knowing language materials. And the applied ecology resources are also multilingual, encouraging the submission of knowing language materials. So instead of leaving important knowing language knowledge scattered everywhere, it is be much, much more efficient and searchable if we could collectively store knowing. Next, pay attention to language balance in conservation. Just like many other measures of diversity, linguistic diversity is often overlooked in conservation communities. But as I have been showing today, language barriers could seriously impede both the, both the compilation and the application of knowledge in conservation. And to address this important issue, we need the numerous languages around the world can bring. And this recent work led beautifully by Avi Lynch at the SGS, we assessed how such linguistic uh, linguistic diversity, and we found that non-native English speakers are sufficiently represented in terms of the number of experts involved. But importantly, their voice in the form. 
try to encourage people to conduct assessment like this at various levels, like journal, editor, journal editorial boards, global collaborations, specialist groups, etc. We still have so many things to do in order to overcome language barriers to the career development of non-native English speakers. For example, a few journals actually provide very good English editing support for non-native English speakers for free. We should definitely expand such efforts to many other journals that have been doing almost nothing to date. We are collecting information on such journals and we can find a preliminary list uh, on our website here from this URL. We can see another excellent example in this year's joint annual meeting of three evolutionary biology societies. At this meeting, Spanish-speaking attendees were allowed to give their oral presentations in Spanish, while the societies offered free English subtitle translations of those Spanish language presentations. There was also a mentoring system where Spanish speaking attendees could meet bilingual mentors and receive support for presentation preparations. So quite often we blindly assume that everyone needs to speak in English at the international conferences, but this example nicely illustrates that there are still many things we can do to support non-native English speakers and increase the diversity of scientific communities. Okay, so I've been talking about some potential solutions, but as you might have noticed, none of them were actually groundbreaking. And that's where the real problem is. They are such straightforward solutions and yet are rarely implemented. So it's a perfect example of where knowing a path is different from walking the path. And indeed, when we look at how we are dealing with the current pandemic, we can see that quite naturally, efforts are being made to overcome language barriers. For example, the WHO now compiles literature on COVID-19 published in 56 languages while the Australian government provides resources on COVID-19 in an impressive 92 languages. But such multilingualization is still far from being common practice in conservation. So what's the difference? Why are we seeing this for COVID, but not for conservation? In my opinion, people are willing to do, do this for COVID because we are desperate. We are desperately trying to synthesize every single evidence and send messages to every single person around the world. But don't we need to do the same for conservation? Are we in a dis less desperate situation with conservation than COVID? I don't think we are, but this is definitely a question that is worth asking. And it is not only for the pandemic. We actually quite naturally try to solve language barriers when, when we feel it is important, such as when welcoming new students to the university campus, at my daughter's daycare to avoid life-threatening accidents, when trying to discourage people from feeding noisy birds in Brisbane, and of course in Cambridge, England, to keep people off the beautiful grass. But to further advance conservation science together with people from a diverse range of backgrounds and to maximize its contribution in tackling global challenges like the biodiversity crisis, I believe efforts to address language barriers need to be made in biodiversity conservation as well. Okay, so that basically concludes my talk today. Lastly, I'd like to thank all the collaborators of our Translate project uh, for the huge Truly huge contribution. Sadly, I only speak Japanese and English, so our work would literally be impossible without their huge help. We are still working on many other exciting research and solutions related to language barriers in conservation. So please do visit our website uh, from this URL. And if you are interested, contact us anytime. Let's work together to solve this critically important challenge in conservation and science. 
Great, that's it. And uh, thanks very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amano. Thank you for your very insightful presentation. No? So the first question here uh, yep. is from Paolo Pagaduan of WWF. Would AI-powered translation systems be the key to transcending these language barriers? You mean machine translation, like Google Translate? Yes. So. Yeah. Yeah, so that is uh, one of the most common questions <laughs> in my yeah. talk on language barriers. And I say yes and no always. So obviously, the quality of machine translation is now rapidly improving. So it's amazing, amazing opportunity. So there are lots of, lots of opportunities to make a better use of machine translation to, to, uh, to tackle this problem. But at the same time, uh, it's still not perfect, obviously. So even a small mistake, small error in machine translation can have a huge effect when, for example, trying to obtain scientific knowledge from a paper written in different languages. So we still need to assess how effective it is, but uh, I, I definitely agree, it, it has a huge potential. Yeah. yeah. We also have a comment from Cynthia, uh, who is the uh, BCSP um, go-to person no, for, for operations. No? So this is a learning point for BCSP and other national uh, groups as well. I believe these are conservation groups. We should not let language hinder our partners on the ground from submitting and presenting their work in scientific meetings like the Philippine Biodiversity Symposium. Maybe we should encourage abstracts and papers in our local language. How would you react to that? Would having local language abstracts and, and uh, sessions be uh, the way to go? Yeah, definitely think so. Yeah, that, that would be an amazing opportunity, a great idea. And um, yeah, perhaps in the, you know, in the future meeting, you might be able to have abstract or even in talks or our presentations in more than one language, maybe in English and in a relevant local language as well. And you might be able to set up the section specific to you know different local languages. So yeah, there are lots of different interesting ideas and you, you should be able to do this kind of things in, in your meeting. Yes. And I, I'm, I'm keen to learn, if you are going to implement this, I'm keen to learn how it will go, how it is, you know, uh, received by conference attendees. Yeah. yeah, so please do let me know. Oh, yeah. Oh, great. Um, yeah, like you said, no, uh, the solutions may not be drastically uh well they may not be really complicated no because um well most groundbreaking breaking solutions to problems are like you said elegantly simple um and we have another question coming in from dr letty afuang of uplb um, perhaps bcsp can start considering generating and developing its own journal so that it can smoothly apply its publishing, uh, its system of accepting and publishing outputs, also practicing inclusivity. Yeah, that's an important point. But uh, from the information uh, you showed in the at the beginning of this session, I think there might be a journal already. Do you have a journal? Uh, not yet. Not yet at the moment. Not yet. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, so obviously establishing a new journal is a, a huge work, but yeah, that, that would be a great idea as well. So around the world, there are many local journals that publish papers in uh, more than one languages. So like in English and in Spanish, Portuguese, in the same journal. So you might be able to think of uh, such a journal publishing papers in multiple languages. Yeah, 
wow, that, that's quite a, a mind blowing uh, idea because we have 120 languages in the Philippines. Yeah, so, <laughs> that is a challenge. It yeah, might, <laughs> it might be a big challenge, but yeah. yeah uh, we, we do publish in journals, but it's not run by the society itself. Mm. There are many local journals, but they're all in English. Um, mm. So we have another uh, question from an anonymous attendee. Thank you for your insightful and relevant talk, um, Dr. Amano. This is not so much a question, but more of a comment. It appears that meta-analysis studies should also be interpreted with caution, especially if only English language papers have been used in these studies. I think so. Yeah, I think so. So, but it also depends on the the scope of each meta-analysis. You know, obviously, if that meta-analysis focuses on something in the UK or in the US excluding no English languages should be fine, obviously. But if meta -analysis, that meta-analysis is supposed to cover the global issue or anything, any topics in, for example, Latin America, in Russia, you, you, know, you should expect to see some no English languages included in those meta-analysis. So if the scope of those meta-analysis is in those regions or you know global scope, and then no English language studies are excluded, you should be careful when looking at those, when interpreting those meta-analysis. Yeah, quite often, you know, no English language studies are automatically excluded, mainly due to the lack of relevant language skills. But that uh, my in my opinion that shouldn't be the reason that's right no? yeah. so, um, there is another question from mr edward Perez Bilen. he said hi dr amano i noticed there was distinction between english others and english official in a couple of your slides oh, yeah yeah i'm yeah. curious as to how are these different yeah so that is the so that, so that is a slide comparing the study quality between different languages. And yeah, that's a spot on. So that difference is basically the, so bo both of those two panels are English language studies, but the uh, English official is represent English language studies conducted in countries where English is the first language, so like the UK, US, Australia, so those countries. And the English others, uh, English language studies conducted in countries where English is not an official language. Mm -hmm. And there is actually a significant difference between these two, two groups of countries. So that means even within English language studies, depending on the countries, the quality of scientific evidence could be different. Mm, I see. Uh, are there any more comments? Questions from the um, from the audience. Uh, I have another question here from Khalil. Do we have a way to account for loss of information in translating English studies to other languages? If so, are there ways to mitigate this, especially in highly technical topics? Mm -hmm. So, you mean the loss of uh, sorry, information during translation? Yes. Well, yeah. during translation. Yeah. yeah. So, for example, if we rely only on machine translation, that can, it is likely that, you know, that kind of things, the loss of, loss of information is likely to happen. You know, there might be some errors, mistakes. So in that sense, for example, if you are going to use machine translation, you, Ideally, you want to secure someone, you know, a human <laughs> with a, a relevant language skill to double check the result. Yes. Yeah, by doing that, hopefully we can avoid that kind of problem. Yeah, so that's why I still think relying only on machine translation is 
a little bit risky, I would say. Right. Yeah. That's right. Oh. Any more? Um, yeah. Okay. So, um, well, in Japan, uh, you have done a good job of really encouraging local researchers to publish in Japanese with English uh, abstracts. I've seen a lot of papers like that. Yeah. And uh, uh, what are the things that you found very uh, useful or uh, have you found effective in bridging these barriers, no? in, mm. in, in breaking down these barriers that you think would work very well in the Philippine context? Mm, given yeah. that we have so many languages yeah that's great point yeah so in that sense the situation might be slightly different in japan for example in japan as, as you said uh if we publish papers in japanese in japanese language journals normally we provide english language abstract as well as english language uh legend uh, captions of figures and tables as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, even native English speakers should be able to understand the, the basic information from abstracts and figures and tables. So, you know, language barriers are a multifaceted problem with uh, two direction of consequences. So if we want to increase the visibility of non-English language science, you, you can't do that kind of things, you know, disseminate your research in English as well, provide, by providing English language information. But there's another direction of consequences, which is uh, uh, you, you, if you are not, you know, less fluent in English, yeah. you, it, it is harder to up the use scientific knowledge that is only available in English. So in that case, you should be able to do the, you know, the other direction of dissemination by translating English language scientific knowledge into relevant non-English languages. So I say there's no, you know, easy, quick solution, but that kind of activities could be a, is a key essentially, yeah. So, yeah, I think we need to invest more in terms in terms of time, effort, money, and I, I think I know this is really hard. Even there are so many other issues you need to overcome. But yeah, not sure if that answered the question. But yeah, yeah, I I think yeah that it should start from there definitely. You know that uh, we should. Uh, provide uh, a venue for local uh, for native language speakers to to actually uh, share their science as well no? mm -hmm. uh, to the world. So, um, there is another question coming in. Thank you for the great talk, Amanu Sensei. <laughs> Would encouraging the publication of studies in native languages help in expanding the vocabulary of the language? as well as create a new avenue in the localization of complex terms. Yeah, I think that is another uh, huge issue. So one, so I showed you the 10 tips for overcoming language barriers. And uh, one of them is uh, translate uh, specific terms in different languages. Because in many languages, you don't necessarily have, you know, exact, exact proper translation of scientific terms. I think that is a huge issue. And yeah, we haven't been working on this issue exactly, but uh, yeah, uh, I believe, yeah, efforts need to be made to translate scientific terms in relevant languages. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so again, um, I, we, we don't have a lot of time left, but there is one more question here. 
from yeah, Dr. A... Leticia Fuang, yeah, from uh, UPLB. Thank you, Dr. Amano, for your very insightful presentation. It actually opens up more windows for partnering with and encouraging the involvement of local people with conservation exchanges. It will be uplifting for the local stakeholders and enriching for the scientists or researchers. Conservation is actually strongest when the local people do the groundwork in leadership, ownership, and sustainability in partnership with the scientists, researchers, or the academe. I think it's a comment. Yeah, yeah thanks very much for this really uh, encouraging and uh, important comment. Uh, yeah, I'm keen to learn situations in the Philippines, so please uh, contact me if you know any examples of language barriers in conservation in your country. Yeah, thank you. Ah, there is one more that uh, yep. uh, came in, into the QA box. For regions whose language are barely being used for technical re uh, research, uh, it is better to have them assimilate in the English path in the first place. Or do you think we should still work towards capacitating that language for scientific research? I think it really depends on depends on the region, depends on the people. You know, people are more used to, to you know publishing in English. They should do so, obviously. They don't need to, you know, they, they are not, they shouldn't be forced to publish in local languages. But what I'm, I want to stress here is the, you know, transferring scientific knowledge across languages is important. So whichever direction it is, you know, publishing in English first and then transfer the knowledge to another language or, you know, vice versa. So that is the, the most important point. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and and a good takeaway message. No, there has to be that uh, uh, you know exchange of ideas across that barrier. No, um, yeah. that has to be that has to happen for things to move forward. Um, so I think that's all the questions that we have. Thank you very much for your very timely and very uh, insightful presentation. Um, Thank you, Dr. Tetsuya. Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much for this great opportunity.